Well, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us here at Shehalem Christian Fellowship, where we were just talking about the great coffee debacle last Sunday. We ran out of straws. The coffee creamer wasn't just right. I mean, there was all kinds of mayhem going on last Sunday. If you were joining us for church and you need that extra burst of energy, well, rest assured, we've gotten things straightened out. There's a new box of, of st stirring straws and I went and I got the real coffee creamer, so things should calm down nicely. But if you do come and join us out at the barn at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, you might want to be, you might want to dress a little bit warm because the weather looks like the weather. The forecast is going to be similar to what we would expect in February, but that is right on pace with Jim's promise to be teaching the warm Sundays and giving me the cold ones. For the very next Sunday, the 10 day forecast is already in. It's supposed to be sunny and warm. So I'm glad you're here. Glad you could join us uh, here at the studio. Uh, Jason is uh, behind the computer screens, pushing the buttons, making the magic happen. And, and Jim has got his Bible open and is ready to study. But before we jump into the study, let's uh, remember communion. Let's observe communion. You know, the, the text that we're going to be picking up it was the night that Jesus was betrayed. The Passover meal had been eaten. The last classes already given to his disciples. The time was at hand. And so he prayed. Even before getting to the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for those who would eventually hear of him through the testimony of his disciples. It was the, his longest recorded prayer in the Bible. It was the Holy of Holies. Well, it's what we've been studying in John chapter 17. Um, but that prayer was over and we're coming to John chapter 18 within the it starts John chapter 18 starts with when Jesus had spoken these words of course referring to the prayer of John 17 he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered the brook Kidron was a small brook and it flowed at some 200 feet below the the temple floor the, the walls of the temple fell away into this deep, this deep ravine. It's a gulch, the Kidron Valley. And the proximity of the temple meant that the blood of the lambs, especially during feast time, when historians tell us that there was an estimated 250,000 lambs sacrificed, the blood would flow from the temple into little rivulets and eventually mix with the blood or mix with the water of the brook Kidron. So it, it begs one to question if Jesus would have noticed at that season as the water he stepped over was mixed with blood. Did he think of his own end when the spear would pierce his side and his blood would be mixed with water as it flowed from him? When he walked into the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane uh, translated means an olive press. Did he think of the pressing that would soon come to him? For his time was at hand. And certainly these things were on his mind. Certainly these daily details had not escaped him. And so he prayed in the garden. The prayer, the, his prayer recorded in Luke 22, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nonetheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's a prayer that was prayed in his anguish, a prayer to avoid suffering. He knew what was coming, a prayer that he prayed to his father. I mean, if anyone had connections, it would have been Jesus. But ultimately, it was a prayer of submission, for he would drink the cup. He would submit. He would suffer. He would die. And he knew that from the beginning, for he knew that there was a plan, a rescue plan. And he stuck to that plan. He paid the price. And today we remember that high cost. Today we drink a cup, a literal cup, a, a small cup of juice in remembrance of the figurative cup that he drank. So if you have the, your communion packet, you can pull the bread and take that in your hand. And Lord, we thank you for your body, for your body that was bruised beyond recognition, the word tells us. We thank you for the suffering that you endured without even, without even a word. Thank you, Lord. Let us take the bread. Let us now take the juice. Lord, I thank you for this, this cup, this cup that represents your body, your blood, 
your blood that was poured out for the remission of sin for the entire world, for all time. The precious blood, the precious cup. Let us take now the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Well, again, thank you for joining us. Let's uh, want to start with a, a story. A story that started with the little cheap cheeping at Wilco as my kids walked through the aisles. Chicks were on sale and it's that time of year. They were super, super cute, so the girls pleaded. They said, well, the Nelsons got a bunch of chicks. Can we get some? And so we caved and we got seven more chicks. Now add that to the fact that the Nelsons already had six and, and we had 11 full grown hens already, one rooster, one duck. And it's not hard to see, you do the math, that the hen house that we have is going to be far too small to accommodate all these chicks when they grow. So that was a problem. So after a lot of discussion, we decided to build a new chicken coop instead of the old one. Actually, we, we, we did this plan evolved. Uh, originally, we we're going to build this new chicken coop. It was going to be the Hilton of all chicken coops. But as Hilton is, it was expensive, too expensive. So we decided, let's, let's just take the goat barn that we have. Let's make a stall within that goat barn and let's, you know, chicken wire the whole thing in and uh, that'll be good. So it was a lot easier, a lot simpler, or so I thought. So on my days off, I, I, I grabbed my screw gun and I headed down to the goat barn. And the first thing to do, I had the screw gun and the hammer and the pry bar. The first thing I needed to do was to dismantle some of the stalls that were already there and do, to, do some cleanup to prepare for this new construction that was going in. And, and as I, I got into it, it became quickly apparent that the two different, very different people had been involved in the construction there. Uh, on one hand, some of what I took apart, well, it was pretty jinky. Uh, things had been jimmy rigged for years. Doors didn't close, gates didn't open. Some of the stalls were walled in. The, the stalls were pallets that had just been roped up to a post with, with baling twine. And some of the work looked shoddy, just kind of cobbled together, the, the get her done mentality. Oh, don't get me wrong, I am a very, I'm an expert at this cobbling together, this get her done this get her done mentality. If you got a job to do and not much time and not a big budget, well, you, you take what you have, you look, what, you look around, you take what you have, or maybe what you can buy at a garage sale and you see what'll work and you just make it happen. So for a couple years, and just an example of this, when we got our dog, we needed a place for our dog to live. And I'm like, yeah, there was a gate that was leaning against one of the sheds and I propped it up or it was propped up and tied around the four by four with some, with some uh, cord. And then I got a, uh, I made my own gate out of PVC pipe that I picked up at a garage sale and some, some wire that I, some uh, fencing that I, that I zip tied to it. And I thought, perfect. That's going to do the job. And it did for a couple years. I never knew that it was ugly. Um, who knew? Uh, my wife is very patient. She's very patient with me. So, so that's just an example of it, of, of my, my skills to cobble things together. Marla's grandpa had a phrase. He would say, it's good enough for who it's for. So that was my mentality with the dog area for a while. It's just for a dog and perhaps for the chicken pen as well. It's just for chickens, good enough for who it's for. So I get it. I know a thing or two about cobbling things together. So I got into this goat barn. I realized I could recognize a co cobble job when I saw it. But as I kept dismantling parts, it also became obvious that much of the original construction was done by someone else, somebody that was a real craftsman, someone who was a real carpenter. I mean, everything was screwed together and, and not just held together with nails that were bent over. The plywood on the end of the feeder boxes, things that nobody would ever see, were expertly cut. It, it was some of the joints and the posts as I got into it, taking them apart, were truly astounding. And it was obvious that whoever built this part of the, the barn didn't have the get her done mentality. They took their time. They spent the right money. They spent money to do it right. And the work showed a certain expertise. And as I was cleaning the stall of where, where, where the stall is going to go, I found buried in the dirt a sign that made everything made sense. It was a white sign with the letters, with our address written on it in the letters, Madsen Construction. 
So the person who had built the barn was a construction worker. They had their own company. I go into all of this because in the text that we're going to study, we're going to see some things cobbled together, things thrown together in a haphazard way simply to get the job done. But then if we take a second look and look real hard, we're going to see the work of the master who was working according to a greater plan, a more glorious plan, a more costly plan. So if you have your Bibles, please open them to the book of John chapter 18, starting in verse 1, where we're going to pick back up in the Garden of Gethsemane, where we read verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, again referring to the words of the prayer that he had spoken on his way, uh, the prayer of Jesus in John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. As before we go on, uh, just uh, uh, I've, I learned many things when I'm studying during the, the week. And one of the things I learned historically is that um, the Mount of Olives that stood opposite the Kidron Valley from the temple and going down the Mount of Olives were private gardens that the aristocracy or the wealthy people of Jerusalem would often escape out of the hustle and bustle of the city. Uh, they weren't like city or state parks. They were literally private gardens. And it's believed that one of the citizens of Jerusalem, the wealthy citizens of Jerusalem, was favorable to Jesus and would grant him and his disciples access into this garden whenever they were in town. So continuing on in 2 and 4. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers, from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Verse 4, Therefore Jesus, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Now before we go on, let's pull up a little bit and just examine the scene just a little bit. Judas was the betrayer. We know that. He was one of Jesus' twelve trusted men. He was leading a group of officers from the chief priests. Back in those days, the temple authorities had a type of private police. Uh, even the Sadducees had their own kind of undercover police officers that would, would be used to bring people, keep people in order. So, so Judas came leading this group of officers from the temple, the police force, but he brought together with them a detachment of troops or Roman soldiers. When you get into the word of, of, of it, it, they, it was called a cohort, uh, and it was no small number of troops. You know, in our movies that we have, there's a small band of troops coming with Judas, or the coloring pages that the kids uh, color for Easter, there's a small band, but the number was a l much larger than just a dozen or a couple dozen. At bare minimum, it was 200 soldiers coming with their weapons, coming with their lanterns and torches. Other numbers, others suge suge suggest that it could have been as much as 600, while others say that it was like, it could have been a thousand men, 240 of which would have been mounted. Regardless, it was a large number. They came in numbers to intimidate Jesus and his followers. But it was a strange mix, of, strange mix of people too. It was the Jews and the Romans working together. Well, this was strange because the Jews didn't like the Romans. The, 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 the Roman, Rome was seen as an occupying force whom, was, whom they greatly resented. But here the Jewish leaders were using the Roman muscle in a joint showing of force, the national police, if you will, with the Roman army. And they came to arrest one man. And Jesus wasn't surprised by this. He knew what was coming, it says. Jesus, seeing them coming with their torches, he left the garden. He led his small band to meet them. Jesus put himself between, he put himself between this, this group of men and his disciples. And he asked them, whom are you seeking, knowing full well their answer? But in verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, it, it was meant to be a derogatory term because Nazareth was not well regarded. Remember when Philip went to tell Nathanael that they had found the Messiah. And, and, and Nathanael responded by saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This title, Jesus of Nazareth, 
was used intentionally to belittle Jesus. He's no Messiah. He's from a backwoods, back county kind of place, Jesus of Nazareth. So, so check out what happens next. When Jesus was confronted by this group of men that came down in a show of force, how he responded to them. Now I'm going to finish the second part of verse 5. And he said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now, when, okay, when he, said, when he said, I am he, the he in most of your Bibles is in italics, meaning that this was added by the, by the editors to the original text. Meaning when the soldiers asked who of Jesus' group was Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said, I am. Now, if you know your Jewish history, that was a bold claim. Oh, it would have gone over the heads of the soldiers, certainly, but not over the heads of the disciples nor the, the officers from the temple. For I am was the first name that God gave himself when he spoke to Moses from that burning bush. I am that I am was the name that he gave himself. As we've been studying the book of John, there's several I am statements of Christ. And, and what, when he said this, what he was saying was understood immediately. Jesus was calling himself divinity. Continuing, uh, okay, oh, and this is when it gets really great. Uh, da, da, da. Now, when he said them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Imagine the scene. Between 200 and 1,000 soldiers, all armed with spears or weapons and swords and torches and lanterns, they come in, in a, a full force of, uh, to, show, uh, to show strength in the middle of the night. And at his words, when he said, I am, in a single instant, they were all knocked to the ground. Jesus was in full command of the situation, regardless of what the soldiers thought, regardless of what the officers or Judas thought. And Jesus maintains the control of this scene in verses 7 and 8, where we, where we read, Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. The he again is an italicized. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. So Jesus was likely standing between his disciples and the soldiers, and he tells the arresting officials, let his disciples go. Let my disciples go. He was protecting them. And verse 9 tells us why. Verse 9 says, and Jesus uh, says, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Continuing on with verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. You know, T Peter takes a lot of flack for a lot of things. And one of the things he takes the most flack for is his lack of courage later this very night when he would cower con when confronted by a servant girl and he would deny his Lord. But we don't see Peter cowering here. Perhaps he was remembering the stories that he had grown up on, the story of Jonathan taking on the Philistine army by himself. Or perhaps he was thinking of, of Samson doing much the same. And if God could use Samson and, and, or John, uh, Jonathan, if he could do it then, well, then he could do it now, right? I mean, wasn't Jesus God incarnate, the son of the living God on his side? Hadn't Jesus just knocked them all down by simply saying two words? So Peter steps forward, he draws his sword, and he starts a swinging. He must have been groggy because he didn't do a good job. He gets the guy's ear. But, but to his dismay, Jesus doesn't back him up. Instead, Jesus rebukes Peter. In verse 11, Jesus talks to Peter. He says, so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? <laughs> Peter was groggy. He had been sleeping in the garden as Jesus had been praying. He, hadn't, he had been jolted out of his sleep by this group of soldiers. And when Jesus' moment had come, he hadn't been ready. So he acted impulsively. Jesus was trying to protect his disciples, to get them off the hook. He didn't want to lose any more disciples. And Peter, in his impetuous, impulsive state, he does the exact opposite. 
he draws his sword and starts to swing, starts to swing. And now the, the Roman soldiers and the officers who had been knocked to the ground and didn't know what to expect when they were knocked to the ground by the words of Jesus. But a, a crazy guy swinging a sword, this they could handle. They had been trained for this. So Peter, so Jesus has to defuse the whole situation. He tells Peter to put his sword away. Other gospel of it, accounts tell us that he healed Malchus, Malchus's ear. It's interesting that this was the last physical miracle recorded of Jesus before he was crucified. And it was to clean up the mess of one of his disciples. It's amazing how follower, as followers of Jesus today, we can make a mess of things in our zeal and our passion for the Lord. But continuing on in verses 12 through 14, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and they bound him. <laughs> Imagine that, binding Jesus. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. There's some strange dynamics here. Uh, you have the high priest, you have Ka you have Annas, who's the father-in-law, you have... It's, it, this, it's just kind of a mess. You might ask yourself why Jesus was brought to Annas' house if Caiaphas was the high priest. Well, in Jesus' day, the position of high priest was a position of power and authority that was auctioned off by Rome to the highest bidder. It was an office of power, a position of power and authorities, authority, and the Romans wanted to gain financially by it. According to the law of Moses, this wasn't to be, for according to the law of Moses, the position of high priest was an appointment for life. Once you were high priest, you were high priest until you die. Now, Annas had been high priest and was still recognized as the power behind the title by the people. That's why Jesus is first brought to Annas' house. History tells us that one time or another, at one time or another, five of Annas' son would occupy the position of high priest. But Caiaphas, his son-in-law, would hold it the longest. So, so they brought Jesus to Annas' house in this sham of a trial. I say sham of a trial because John already tells us that Caiaphas, who would later also later judge Jesus, had already determined that Jesus was guilty and he should die. It was expedient that one man should die for the people. So this, this, this trial was just really a show because their minds were already made up. And it was not just a show, it was a sham of a trial in other regards too. As you, if you were studying with us a, a couple Gospels ago, or Jim was, had explained it and pointed out from other uh, Gospel accounts that even according to their own laws, they were breaking their own laws. For according to their own laws, they couldn't hold trial for a capital offense at night. And this was the middle of the night. According to their own laws, they couldn't sentence a person, sentencing a person to, to death, a sentencing, reading of a ver excuse me, arriving at a verdict and sentencing the person to death could not happen on the same day. They had to happen on different days. So the judge, the judges could sleep on the decision. But... But it didn't happen this way for Jesus. This was a mockery of a trial. And then and as we continue the reading the account of John's gospel account, in verses 15 through 18, John shifts the focus of the camera from Jesus to Peter. Now we go to Peter, uh, verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. We know that that other disciple was, was John. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood out at the door outside. Then the other disciple, whom was known by the high priest, went out and spoke with her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Most scholars know that this person, whom was unnamed, this other disciple, was the, the apostle John. How was Peter known, or how was John known to the high priest, you might ask? Well, Scripture tells us that he and his brother James were sons of Zebedee. Now, that might not mean much to you and me today, other than the fun name, Zebedee. It's fun to say, maybe fun to spell. But it, it was believed that Zebedee was a pretty important guy in the fishing world in those days. It's believed that he had a fleet of fishing ships on the Sea of Galilee, and he would sell his salted fish 
in the markets there in Jerusalem. In fact, uh, up till very recent times, there was a coffee shop in Jerusalem that claimed to be located at the fish markets of Zebedee. If this is true, then John and his brother James would likely have personally made deliveries into Jerusalem. And perhaps it was at one of these or several of these deliveries where he became known to the high priest and the, the family or the, the, uh, the household of the high priest. In any event, the apostle John is recognized. He's let into Annas' courtyard. Then he talks to the gate, gatekeeper and convinces her to let Peter in too. But Peter's recognized. As we'll, as we'll see in verse 17. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? Are you? And he said, I am not. That's denial number one. Now the servants and the officers who had made fire, a uh, fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And he, Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now, in today's study, I don't want to focus a lot on, on Peter and his denial. There is a lot of room for this, and we'll, we'll study this more. We've studied this in the past, and we'll study more in the future when Jesus comes and restores Peter. Uh, but I just want to point out that Peter put himself in a precarious situation when he went to warm himself by the fire. In Psalm, I'll flip there quickly. It's a very famous, the very first verse of the book of Psalms. Psalm 1, 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits at the seat of the scornful. You could almost throw in there by implication or warms himself in the fires of the evil men. Just a note of warning. Be careful when you seek comfort in the midst of the ungodly. Whether it's movies that you watch when you just want to relax or, with, or the people you hang out with when you want to let your hair down. Be careful. Be wary. Okay, back to Jesus. Verse 19. Then the high priest asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Again, this, this questioning went against their own laws because they had something kind of like our Fifth Amendment where you don't have to say anything that would incriminate you. Jesus didn't have to speak. Other people, other witnesses were to speak. It was to be the testimonies of other people's, their accusations against Jesus. So knowing this, check out Jesus' response in verses 20 and 21. Jesus answered them, I spoke openly to the, wor to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temples where Je the, the Jews always met. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I have said. His response was lawful, even though they weren't lawful, but it didn't do him a lot of good. Check out what happened in verses 22 and 23. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who, st who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? This was the first time that he was going to receive a beating. This wasn't even a beating. He was just struck once. But he answers the man. He answers the man of violence with words. He, he invites the man to think, why do you do this? The corruption that surrounded Jesus at this point was absolutely astounding. I mean, Jesus at Annas' house, the same Annas who is believed for establishing the markets in the temple courts, the ones who were famously ripping people off, ripping pilgrims off, the ones who would charge this exorbitant amount of money for for, for uh Temple approved sacrifices. Well, this, these, these, these markets got under Jesus' skin so much so that he's the one that drove them out with a cord of whips. He had turned the tables and driven them, driven them out. Jesus had cut into their profit margins and the people highly regarded Jesus. So I can't help but think that Annas was sitting there a little smugly, a little bit more than satisfied with himself and the situation that night as he sat in judgment of Jesus. The trial was a sham. The judges were corrupt. They had the power and they employed violent men like the one that struck Jesus. 
But Jesus, in response, didn't make the man's hand shrivel, shrivel or wither away. He didn't make his bowels burst from within him. No, he asked him a question. Did I say something wrong? Was I out of line? Oh, where was it? What did I say? If I've spoken the truth, why did you hit me? Think about it. He asked the man of violence a question. He asked him to stop and think about his actions. I've heard it said that violent people can only understand one thing, and that's violence. And if you want to get through to a violent person, well, this is the way you do it. You got to speak their language. But Jesus didn't answer evil with evil. He didn't stoop to that level. If I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why did you strike me? It's interesting. At that point, verse 24 tells us, Verse 24 tells us, Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Perhaps Annas was wanting to help Caiaphas out a little, to hear Jesus first so that he could give his son-in-law a couple of hints of the official charges that he would have to present uh, against Jesus when he would bring him against the Roman uh, magistrate, the Romans who were in charge. And now John swings his camera back to point at Peter in verses 25 through 27. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you are, not, are, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied, denied again, and immediately the rooster crowed. This was the low point of Peter's life, and it's said that for the rest of his life, when Peter's adversaries wanted to get under his skin, they would crow like a rooster. This was the moment of Peter's greatest shame, provoked, provoked no doubt by, in part by his supreme confidence in himself. For he was the first that said I, that he was willing to die for Jesus or die with Jesus. He was the one that had proved his courage by drawing his sword. And that is ultimately where confidence in the flesh, confidence in ourselves will lead us into moments of shame and disgrace. But as I said before, I don't want to lose our focus on Jesus. We need not worry about Peter for Jesus will also redeem Peter's disgrace in a masterful way. We'll get to those, that moment in coming studies, but for now, let's return to Jesus. Jesus is surrounded by the corrupt, violent men. He's now before Caiaphas, 28. Well, then, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, Praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Not just corruption, but their hypocrisy is also astounding. Of all the laws that they were breaking, their own laws, God's laws, they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled. The pretentiousness of that. Jesus was right when he said of them in Matthew 23, 23, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay a tithe of the mint and the, and the anise and the cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you have ought to done without leaving the others undone. You, you look at the little things, but you forget the big things. Now, continuing on in verse 29. We read, Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? Enter into the scene, Pilate. They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would have not delivered him up to you. Now, what we have to understand about Pilate is that the Jews had Pilate between a rock and a hard place, and they well knew it. Pontius Pilate was the prefect, the governor or magistrate, that ruled over the, the Roman province, province of Judea. And here I want to I talk about the history and Pilate just a little bit to give you an idea of where they had him. When, when Herod the Great died, he ruled over uh, Judea for the Roman emperor. His rule was divided by, between his three sons. But his son Herod Archelaus 
who was left over Judea began to charge such high taxes that the people complained to Rome. And so Rome intervened. They listened to the people, to the Jews, if you will. They intervened making Judea a province of Rome under the authority of a prefect. Now, now the Roman headquarters of Judea was located in Caesarea and not in Jerusalem. But because of the, prefect, the prefect would have to visit important cities every year, they would often come into Jerusalem during feast times just in case an uprising were to gain momentum during one of those times when all the people were together. So, so Pilate was there. But this wasn't the first time that Pilate had come to town. In fact, the first time that he had come to town, he marched in with his soldiers as the prefects did. But on the top of the flags that his soldiers were carrying was a bust of the Roman emperor. Now, this was something that had been done all over the Roman Empire, but the previous prefects knew that this would have been considered idolatry by the Jewish people and their leaders. So they didn't come in with the flags with the little bus of the golden bus of, of Caesar. On our flags, we have sometimes the American Eagle on top. They had Caesar. The other prefects had removed that. Well, not Pontius Pilate. When he marched into town the first time, he, he paid no attention to the tradition or the history or the culture of these people. And it was like stirring up a hornet's nest. He got in big trouble for that. There was a huge people, group of people that went back to Caesarea and were willing to die for it. So that was strike one against him. That was the first time. Then later, again, showing his lack of understanding or lack of patience with the Jewish traditions, he violated a, another one of their traditions, and the people appealed to Rome and won. That was strike two. So Pilate was already on thin ice with Rome, and the religious rulers knew it. The, Rome wanted two things of people who they governed. They wanted them to pay taxes, and they wanted them to be peaceful. And Pilate's rule had been anything but peaceful. And the Jews were good at an uprising. They had him between a rock and a hard spot, and they knew it. That's why they said, if he were not an evildoer, we would have not delivered him up to you. Continuing on in verses 31 and 32, we read, Then Pilate said to them, take your, Do you take him and judge him according to your law? Therefore the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he should die. You see, two years earlier, when Rome had taken the right of capital punishment away from the Jews, it was said that many of the Jewish religious leaders put on sackcloth and ashes and went about the city streets mourning, saying, God has failed his promises and his word. Because they remembered the, God, the promise that God had made through Jacob when he prophesied to Judah. He, he said uh, uh, to Judah, his son, the scepter should not depart from Judah until the Messiah comes. And so in the year 30 AD, when the Roman government took away the right of capital punishment, it was viewed by many as the removing of the scepter of power from the tribe of Judah. And they lost it. They went about mourning. And I wonder if in their mourning, they got mad at God. I wonder if they thought, what good is this anyway? Where is God? And I wonder if it wasn't because that they had gave them because of this that they gave themselves fully over to corruption and being going after power, because God had forsaken them, because God's word had failed. But what they didn't know is that the Messiah had come. What they didn't know is that the Messiah was already in their midst, was the very one they had standing before the prefect. Now, continuing on in verses 33 through 38, Pilate's going to have his first conversation with Jesus. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Jesus had no time even then for presumptuous questions. He wanted to get to the heart of it. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? 
Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And in 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? Now, this question Pilate asked of Jesus, it was a rhetorical question. Uh, he wasn't looking for an answer. He wasn't seeking. He wasn't a seeker. And in all honesty, I can't blame him for asking. I mean, everything was so muddled. Power. Who had the power? Sure, he had the title, but the people had him backed into a corner and they knew it. Something they'd be sure that he knew in the next chapter by saying, we have no king but Caesar. Basically, think carefully, buddy, about what you're doing. Because well, if you, it doesn't go according to how we want it, we're calling your boss. We have no king but Caesar. He had the power, but it was an illusion of a power. And the irony of them saying they had no king but Caesar. I mean, didn't they want Rome out of there? Didn't they want to rule on their own? Weren't they waiting for a Messiah, a Savior, a Liberator? Everything was, was so muddled. Everything was crazy that night. From, from the unlikely alliances of a disciple lead, of a group from Jesus' own trusted men leading a group of soldiers and Jewish temple guards. Everybody was wanting their own thing. Everybody was trying to manipulate the system, trying to force a hand, trying to get their way what they want, trying to do what was right in their eyes. What was right? What was truth? I don't blame Pilate for asking this rhetorical question. He was between a rock and a hard place. He didn't think Jesus was guilty, even as he would tell the Jews at the end of verse 28, I had only, or 38, I had only read the first part. The end, he says, it says, And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But it wasn't over, not by a long shot. The whole situation was just jinky. It was slipshod. It was all cobbled together. Like the goat barn from the beginning, or at least part of the goat barn, hammered, hammered together with every which direction, a scrap of wood here, a scrap of wood there, just to get her done. Good enough for who it's for mentality. This guy's got to be crucified now. We can't wait, or we're telling your boss. But what's he done? His kingdom is of a different world. What's that all, all about? It was a lot of tough questions to be facing so early in the morning. The funny thing is, this was the central event of all of human history. And it was happening right then, right on Pilate's watch, though he knew it not. And though he asked the question, what is truth? He never recognized that there, right in his presence, standing right before him was the truth. For Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What he didn't recognize was standing there before him was one greater than Caesar himself, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all the old things seemed to be spiraling out of control in this tornado of, of thirst, of power and control and jealousy. It wasn't out of control. For he, the one who was bound in Pilate's presence, the one who was getting all the questions asked of him, though he was bound, he was in perfect control. You see, Jesus was working according to another plan, a plan that had long ago been established. Earlier today, I talked about two different kinds of construction. One is cobbled together. You take whatever's laying around and you make what you can. It's practical. It's pragmatic. It's not pretty. It's probably not going to last long. It's cheap, but at least it gets the job done, right? At least... For a while, it does what I want it to do. The other type of construction, well, it takes time and it's expensive. It costs. It can't be rushed. You can't cut corners. You can't use inferior products. It's this type of construction that will last. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was there paying the high price, working according to a master plan. I mean, even in the verses that we read today, verse 9, it says, that the saying might be fulfilled. How many times have we read, it? not just in John, but in the other gospel accounts, that he did what he did to fulfill what was written. When he was on earth and subject to time like you and I are, he was here not to do his will, but to do the will of him who sent him. He was here to do the will of the Father, to drink the cup the Father had given him, though it cost him dearly. Following a well-designed 
plan. It's not cheap. It's not easy. It isn't always expedient to what we want in getting our way, but it does bring the Father glory. While I was studying this, this text this week, I, was, I'm thinking, I think it was fascinating that Jesus wasn't corrupted. He was brought into this cave of lions, bound in the midst of corrupt men. He didn't stoop to their level. He didn't, it, it, those who were ignoring the procedural laws, he kept the law. He didn't testify on his own behalf. To the violent man who struck him, he didn't re- retaliate in the like manner. He remained pure and spotless for he was and is the perfect spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But do you know what Jesus did before he was standing before Pilate? Before the cross, before he had even entered Jerusalem? Do you know what he did before people, before he called people to follow him? Before the miracles? Before being famous? Jesus was a carpenter. Think about that. He was a carpenter. He knew a thing or two about good construction and about craftsmanship, following a plan. Even even when he was living in ambiguity, he was creating beautiful things, quality things, useful things. Listen to what Paul told the believers in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk before them, that we should walk in them. We are His workmanship. I wonder if sometimes we give Him the freedom to do in our lives what He wants according to His plans. Or do we recoil when it hurts? Do we say, make the stop, make the hurting stop, make it easier, make it not cost so much? When we are around corrupt people, do we allow ourselves to be corrupted? Do we say, well, he fouled me first. He pushed me first. I'm just speaking the language he understands. Do we want to follow what he wants us to do? Because as one of my daughters used to say when she was little, but because I want to do what I want to do. Do we follow those ones, cobbling together as best we can our own perfect world, which at some point falls apart anyway when it's exposed? And when it does, it can be an embarrassment, like bits of nails holding together scraps of wood. Folks, we are His workmanship. We are to follow His example. We are not. We are to follow His plans. In 1 Peter 2, the Apostle Peter would write that we are living stone, we are as living stones being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We are being built up in the Lord. The Lord is constructing in us. We are His workmanship. Do we let Him work, cost what it might, or do we resist it? Do we insist on doing what's fast and what's easy? Jesus didn't resist. Even though he was falsely accused, even though it would cost him dearly, he followed through with a plan, a plan that brought glory to God, good enough for who it's for. Well, he was doing it for his Father. He was doing it for God's glory, according to his plans. May that be our desire today. May we trust him to do what he needs to do as we look to him, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for the the shem of a trial that you endured. You knew the pain and the suffering was coming. And it was being delivered by corrupt, evil men. But ultimately, it was the will of your Father. Ultimately, it pleased the Lord that you bear the suffering. Oh, those verses are hard to understand. But you trusted your Father. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us not to insist on knowing exactly what you're doing or how long it's going to last or when we're going to feel better. Lord, make us something glorious, something glorious that will bring honor and glory to you and the Father. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. If you can join us, we'll be out at the barn, uh, 14141 Northeast CUNY Road. Dress warm, and uh, we hope to see you on Sunday. Have a great day. Ciao.